Hi, welcome to Lab One Home. Um, and uh, today I'm going to kind of talk you through the procedures for getting started um, with you know, our home-based labs. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through this tutorial that I put together, which is a PDF document that you can get on Leia. I'm also going to talk you through there's a script that I posted on Leia um, that it's easy that you can download that includes all the different commands and procedures that I've used today. Um, you can also get on Leia um, different data sets that you can download um, that I've used in this tutorial. So that's um, the best thing for you to do is to run through and try all the different procedures um, that I've done. For the home component of uh, our labs, I've chosen to go with the statistical software, um, R. Um, so what is R? It's an open source statistical programming language. Um, so unlike, say, SPSS, um, uh, which is just kind of a statistical software, R is actually a computer programming language, similar to, say, C++ or Java or Python. Uh, it uh, is used primarily just for statistical purposes. Um, so it's say, less complete or um, used for fewer different applications, um, but it follows kind of the, the basis of the computer language. Um, but the coding of it for the type of things that we're going to be doing is quite simple. And we're going to look through some of the basics today. Um, oftentimes, it's actually viewed as more difficult to learn. Um, but for what we want, it actually offers multiple advantages. Um, first, it's free to download and use. Um, down, buying uh, licenses to a software like SPSS can cost hundreds of dollars. And that's true for most of the other statistical softwares that are available. Um, you do have access to Excel, but Excel is more of a spreadsheet program than uh, an actual statistical software. You can do some basic statistics, but you're going to run into limitations um, with Excel pretty quickly. Also, if, you, if you're knowledgeable on how to use other softwares, you can teach yourself Excel uh, very, very, very easily. It's updated frequently, um, R. Um, so it's a collaborative project with many, because it's open source, many different people can contribute packages of functions to different uh, statistics, um, different procedures. Um, and because it's updated frequently, um, if you get more advanced, this is for our purposes, we're using fairly basic functions, uh, very basic statistics. Um, this isn't too big of a concern, but if you continue on in statistics uh, later on, um, this is, can be really, really important because within programs like SPSS or Excel, you're oftentimes when you're dealing with more complex procedures, going to run into situations where um, it can't be done in SPSS. Um, so it's comprehensive. You're unlikely to ever find something that you can't do in R, which isn't the case for uh, some of the other uh, softwares we've seen. Um, the biggest selling point, other than it being free, that um, I really like is it's online friendly. Um, in class, you know, where uh, it can be relatively easy to show uh, how to use SPSS, uh, but um, in terms of a tutorial, following step by steps of clicking through menus can actually be rather confusing. Uh, whereas R is code based, it's not menu-based, and so if you just follow a step-by-step -step procedure that you're shown in the tutorial, uh, it's very difficult to, to mess up. So in terms of teaching you how to use it, I actually think that it may be easier because it's easier to just follow a step-by-step -step guide. Um, it also has extensive support, so obviously you can email me if you have any questions, but there's also a lot of different, even when you get past this class, there's a lot of different ways that you can get help uh, for R, largely based on the idea that it's kind of a community of people um, with it being open source, right? So there's a built-in help function using the question mark function in R that you can get uh, information about um, different functions that you're using. Um, each different package, a package is just kind of a, you know, a, a set of different uh, functions as documentation that you can get online um, and often right through R. Um, that provides kind of information about the different uh, functions that you're using. Um, and um, what has often really, really helped me are online communities. So if you run into a problem, you're not the first person who's ever run into this problem. There's all kinds of online communities where people have posted questions, have posted problems, and others have helped them through it. So I've actually, I've been using R for uh, probably about 
six years and I've never had to post a question there because I've always been able to find someone else before me who's posted the question. Um, so uh, in terms of support, um, there's many, many different options. Um, and moving forward, um, particularly as you're moving on to other projects um, or if you move on to research in university, um, it's reproducible. Um, so if you provide someone with your code and your data, they can reproduce exactly what you've done. So in terms of you know, research, this is really good so that people know that you can cheat, but it's also really good for yourself. Um, you can use your own code. So say you're not finished uh, a lab in one day, you can just save your code, open it, and you're right back to where you left off, which is really useful. Um, you can also use kind of the code that you've used in one project to help you with another. So oftentimes when I get started on a new project, I use code that I've written in the previous project um, kind of as a template or a shell for my new one, um, which is really, really, really helpful. Um, so to use um, R, you're going to have to install two different programs. Um, and you can install it on either a Windows or Mac OS. Uh, so the first uh, would be uh, you'd have to install R itself. Um, we're not actually not going to use this. Also comes with kind of a shell or a program that you can use for using the language. We're not actually going to use that shell. Um, and you can get it. These are links that should take you close to being able to download it. Um, it may depend on kind of how old uh, your operating system is, whether you can use the exact ones that are posted here, but this should get you close on um, these different websites. If you have any trouble, either email me, but you can also just Google and find like the um, Google R statistical program. It'll take you to the website. And then if you do Google R Studio and you can click the download button, choose the one that best fits your computer, um, pro, uh, your like your computer's capabilities, your computer's operating system. Uh, so the next one you're going to need to download is RStudio. Um, RStudio is a more user-friendly um, application for running R. It just makes, uh, nobody I know actually runs it in the R shell itself. Um, this just makes it more user-friendly. You can see a lot more things at once. Um, and so uh, each time that you actually start, all you'll have to do is open RStudio. You still have to download R. Uh, but each time you do a lab, you'll just have to open R Studio and it'll automatically launch R itself. Um, and so we'll take a look now at R Studio. All right. So when you first um, open R Studio, this is kind of what the interface will look like. So you'll have three different panels. You'll have a big one here on the left, and then you'll have one on the top right and one on the top left. Um, where for I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Uh, on these, uh, I'll just, I can quickly show you what it looks like in uh, our studio itself. Right, so you have these three different panels. Uh, but the first thing that I want you to do um, before we can go any further is open what's called a new script, right? So go to file, new file, and our script, right? And now you're going to have four different uh, windows. And so um, these are the ones that we're going to be using that provide a lot of different information. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to open also what we're going to be using for um, today. So this is kind of the, the script that I've read for today's lab. So what you can now download and open in our studio. So these are all the different things that we're going to go through. Um, in R. Um, so let's go back to the actual tutorial. All right. So once you've opened our script, like I said, this is what um, it looks like. Uh, I want to show it here um, because it shows. So here's kind of different things with kind of examples. So I want to talk through all four boxes, right? So in the top left, and the text will be below, but I'm going to talk through it while I've got the image here. All right, so there's a few different things that we can do here. So you're going to spend most of your time when you're working in R. And this is where you can write kind of a script. And it's kind of like a, a menu of things that you want R to do. Um, now, you can also um, post commands here. So you, here you kind of write like a, a list of different commands you want R to run. Um, you can do it down here, right? But writing it up here has some important advantages that I'm going to show you quickly. Um, 
So I'm just going to open R, right? R Studio. Now let's go to just like a blank script. So I could write right here at the blue arrow, I could write, say I wanted to find what one plus one is equal to. I could write one plus one, hit enter, and it'll show me the answer is two. I could do two plus two is equal to four, right? Um, and obviously we do much more complicated things, but if you close R, right, this will disappear. Um, and so if you restart, so you get halfway through a lab or you're working on a big research project for a future class, right? If you close this, it's all gone. Um, where I write one plus one up here, if I hit enter, actually nothing happens, but I can write a whole bunch of things, right? I can write one plus one, two plus two. And then if I hit run right here, and run them, I'll see one plus one is equal to two and two plus two is equal to four. So I get the same output that I got here, right? But I can save it, right? I can save, for example, this document, which has all the things for the lab, I saved. So anytime I want to come back to you know, this lab, I wrote this um, yesterday, but I'm showing it today. And I didn't keep our studio open all night. Um, I just saved it as a script. And so I could run, just I could highlight everything, click run, and I'd run through all the labs. I'd load all the data that we're using today. I'd produce all the plots or graphs that we're producing today. Um, I'd do all the calculations that we're doing today all at once. Um, and so uh, this is the way that I suggest that you always, you know, use R, always write, unless you just want to be checking something, right, that you don't need to save. Um, always write something in a script. Um, save those scripts into kind of your project uh, folder. We'll talk more about kind of project folders later. Uh, and uh, this way uh, you'll, you know, be able to open stuff later. You also have kind of a whole bunch of scripts that you can um, cheat off later. And I don't mean cheat in a bad way. I mean more as just, you know, so that you can remember the different commands that you've learned. Um, so I encourage you throughout, you know, the presentation today to pause and try, as I'm teaching you different commands, you know, try writing in a script and hitting run. So the important buttons here include the save button. Um, so here, every any time that you've written something new that's unsaved, that's not saved, um, you will get the save button you can click on. Um, and the text of your tab of your project will be in red, um, showing that. So if I you know, write something, something's changed from what I had before. So save is now available and it's in red. So it's showing me, okay, you've got to save this. So I'm just going to save. It goes back to, can't click on it, and back to the name of the project is um, in, uh, in black, um, which is really useful. And the other is run, right? So if I wanted to run like what I showed, the one plus one, I highlight what I want to run. I click the run button and I get the output down here. So um, rather than running your code here, use here for um, outputs and for error messages, right? So if I wrote, for example, one equals one plus, this is, I guess this. Okay, that's it. Uh, well, in this case, it shows a plus because I never, told it how to finish. Uh, so in that case, we'd have to add a one. So there's no actual error message in this case. Now we finish it. So it can show us, okay, did oh, I leave my command um, incomplete? Or if I wrote one is equal to one plus, right? Uh, I want to, I'm just trying to find something that would definitely give us an error message. It should give us an error message. Right, so um, for reasons that uh, we'll talk about later, this is an invalid uh, text to write. Uh, and we'll, you'll see why this is invalid later, but we get an error message. Um, so if, uh, this is something that you're also always going to want to check, and I'll give a little bit of an explanation as to what you did wrong. 
Um, so those are the big things that you'll have here. If you have a blue arrow, it means you can type. So you can enter a new command, you can run something new, and you can see the outputs. You can copy and paste the outputs into a you know, Word document along with the command that you ran. You can check for error message, and you can check that it's ready. Sometimes you can run, if you're not in this course, but if in other, you know, if you're using more advanced things than R, you're sometimes going to run a command that will take 10, you know, 10 minutes, five hours to run. So if you're either waiting to, for uh, the blue arrow until the, you know that you can run some more. Um, in the, uh, okay, let's go back to the tutorial. Um, okay, so we've got you know the script up here. We've got kind of the output, the console down here. So you can enter your commands, or you, for more, you can check what are the different outputs. So here's a whole bunch of commands I run and a whole bunch of output. Here's a long script. Um, over in this tab, there's a few things that you can do. So first, you can see um, the different data sets that you've entered with a little bit of information. So I've got one uh, called beer open here with 400 observations of uh, uh, and the number of variables. Uh, and different values, so the different kind of values you saved into variables. Uh, so I've got, uh, you know, and a little bit of information about them. If you double click on one of the data sets, you'll, it'll also open a tab over here um, with kind of data in a spreadsheet type format, um, which is uh, useful uh, for you um, if you want to inspect your data. Um, if you don't really know what's in it, or if you're getting an error that you can't understand and you want to look in the data, never change your data here, right? There's ways of manipulating your data through text that's reproducible. Um, if you change it, you know, in the data viewer uh, and you make a mistake, it's hard to go back. It's hard to keep track of what you did. So we like to always keep track of everything we've done. So more use of data viewer just if you want to inspect. But I'm also going to show you other ways of inspecting your data. And then in the bottom right, so this is useful to see what's open. Um, once in a while, it's good to clear. So that kind of the button right here uh, will clear the workspace. So if you've done a project and you've got a whole bunch of data sets open and variables saved, it's good to just clear it so that you delete all of them. Um, and just so that you're not having too many things loaded or it's too hard to figure out, you know, what is it that I'm actually looking at right now. And then in the bottom right, you can see either uh, there's a few different things, but there's two that are particular interest. So you've got the plots tab. So here I've got, you can see a, a box plot. Um, and so anytime you make a graph, you'll be able to see it here and you can, you know, cycle using the arrows to the different plots that you've made. You can also export them as images, um, as PDFs, or you can copy it to the clipboard. So if I tell you in an exercise to make, you know, an image, you can export it to the clipboard and then paste it into your Word document, or you can save it as a picture and paste it into your Word document. Um, so that's really, really useful. Um, and because it opens right in here, you can see, okay, did I run the code properly? Does this look like the graph that I expected? You know, does it have the proper labels, everything like that. Um, and you've got help. So if you run the help function, it'll open in the help tab, in documentation about the different function you're running. So what are the different options? What is the code supposed to look like? So as long as you know the, the variable name, or sorry, the variable, the function name, um, such as like say mean, you would run question mark mean, and it would tell you all the information about the mean function in R. Um, so those are the two major things. There's other things you can see, like list of files, if you need to be opening something, or list different packages of functions that you have. Um, access to. Most of the ones that we're going to be using, or all the ones we're using today, are actually pre-installed packages in um, R. Um, so, but those two you're not going to go too terribly frequently. It's more the plots and the help that'll be useful. So top right is, top left is where you're going to do most of your work. You're going to see the answers to your work in the bottom left. You're going to see what data you have open in R in terms of data sets and variables in the top right. And you're going to see your plots and your help in the bottom right. And so this is just kind of running through what I've said that you can read. Uh, 
So if you could read through these, these are the different to all four boxes. All right, so some of the basics of working in R. Um, so first is commenting. Um, so oftentimes, if we just write a whole bunch of code, um, it would be really, really hard to figure out what's doing, uh, what's happening, and someone else reading your code might not know why. Why am I using this function? If they've never seen the function before, they might be really confused. You might sometimes also confuse yourself. You don't remember why you're doing something. So we use comments to identify what we're doing and to organize our documents uh, better or our scripts better, um, so that it's more legible to someone else. Um, and that kind of fits in with norms of how you should structure your scripts that are common in uh, R. And we're going to learn about a lot of them as we go along. Um, but so there's a couple important things that you can do using uh, commenting. And uh, some are, for example, adding titles to sections. Right? So I can do, for example, this is a title to a section. Or I can put a title to a question. Right? So everything this is in lab one, and everything below here is in question one. And the way you comment is simply, you might be able to guess looking at this, is using the um, hashtag. Um, so anything in R to the right of a hashtag uh, won't be run as, a, say, a command. It, um, R is told to just skip over it when you run, um, say, um, this. So R would just simply print this when it's running it, but not actually think that there's any commands here. So you can write any bit of text that you want as long as it's to the right of a hashtag. Um, you can also describe what you've done, right? So these ones start a line, but you can put it after a command, right? Because so this part, um, this part of the command is to the left of the hashtag. So when R runs it, it'll run it as a command. But this part is to the right of it, so it won't run it as a command, right? So I can describe what I'm doing here. So here, for example, I've got uh, two scores on an exam, and I want to take the average. So I sum them and divide it by two. So I'm averaging scores from test one and test two. So now when I look at this, otherwise I might forget why did what was 0 0.75 and 0 0.95, and why do I sum them divided by two? Uh, but here I've got text showing um, why I'm doing it. Um, and just quickly shifting back to our uh, studio. Right, and if we go into the script for today, so commenting, so we've got commenting, uh, and we've got question one, for example. This is showing this is question one, and here's the text for question one, or the command for question one along with kind of a description. So if I run this, right, if I just select all this and run it, right, so none of this, it's not trying to figure out what this is, it just prints up to the right of the hashtag, but it runs this and produces the average was 0.85. Um, and so that's really useful. And you're gonna see throughout this entire lab, I separate into different sections with identifiers, you know, so the more my personal way, and a lot of people do this, is the more kind of like hashtags you have is more important sections or super important, you can kind of surround it. Um, it's just ways of showing kind of like section headings of different importance. So this might be like section one, 1.1, 1 1.1.1, type thing if you were looking in a book. Uh, and so you can and describe everything you're doing. So throughout, we're going is you see different commands. I'm describing what each of these different commands does. So it makes it just for um, you as a student, but you, for anybody who's reading the code, it lets them know, okay, what is it that I'm trying to do here? Uh, and this is something important to do when you're submitting labs, because if, even if you get it wrong, right, if you're explaining to me what you're trying to do, then I can see at least, you know, where you're going wrong. wrong. Right, back to the tutorial. Um, the next thing that's um, important to start with is just basic arithmetic. We're using statistics. We're going to be using, you know, uh, doing a lot of math. And so how do we do just basic arithmetic, right? So addition, um, if you can guess, you just use the plus sign. Uh, so you notice I put a space between one plus, like between the one and the plus. You don't have to, right? Like I could put no space with one, no space plus, no space two and run it, and it would make no difference. Um, but me and a lot of people, we like putting spaces. It just makes your code easier to read with more spaces. Uh, it makes it look nicer. Uh, so that's kind of another one of those conventions like commenting that a lot 
people like having space between kind of your the numbers and the symbols. Uh, it, it, it makes your code more readable. And so this would be the output that you would get if you ran it. So uh, I actually wrote this the entire tutorial, this PDF in R. So these are embedded lines of code uh, that you get from um, R, but I'll show it in, in R after. Subtraction, just you know, a normal minus sign. Uh, for multiplication, a star. Uh, division, you know, your slash. You, uh, if an exponent, there's two different ways, right? You can use the, uh, I don't actually know what this thing's called, but like the, the hat thing, or two stars. And they'll both do the same thing, right? So two exponent three, the two exponent three, both give eight. Um, apps, uh, sorry, square root. So here you'd write square root and put the number in parentheses, right? So square root of 25 would give you five. So there's no symbol for square root. It's an actual command name with a function name. And absolute value, same thing, right? So you'd put the number that you want the absolute value in in the function for absolute value. So ABS, open parentheses, the number you want, close parentheses, and it'll give you 20. Um, if you're doing uh, multiple, if you're doing kind of multiple uh, calculations in one, R follows the uh, PEMDIS or PEMDIS, depending on which one you learned, uh, order of operations, so parentheses or uh, brackets, exponents, multiplication, division, uh, addition, subtraction, uh, order of operations. Um, so make sure you use your brackets if you, uh, if you want to have an addition come before. A, uh, for example, in the average uh, example I showed um, above, right? Because order of operations, the video would come first, but I want the addition to be done first. I put it in brackets, uh, which is the same as what you'd be doing in a calculator. All right, so let's, let's quickly show this in our studio. Right, and so I, again, you can download all this code. I would so you can be seeing this too uh, in your R Studio. Um, you, I would also suggest that you try typing all this out and seeing what happens, um, one you know at a time. I'm just going to run all of these at once. Uh, you, I could have run one at a time, and you can see, you know, all the different outputs here. And um, that's one of the things that I, I really like. It's, uh, that it's easy. You could just type all of it in. You don't have to go through menus. You can just do all the different things. Um, but so far, everything that we've done has been relatively simple. But you know, we're not just using R as a as a calculator. Uh, we want to be using variables and data sets and stuff like that. So let's get this a little bit more uh, complex, right? So and talk a little bit about the data structures. So. So far, we've been using just basic mathematical operations. But what if you want to save the results of the calculation later, right? What if you know my uh, absolute value of tw minus twenty is important to me? It's not. It's something that I want to remember for later. Um, and so, what I can do is I can assign it to a variable, uh, right? So, if you want to save the answer of two plus four to a variable a, because we're going to be using this answer to two plus four later, right? And so, we want to remember it. We can assign it to a variable a, and we do so by using um, this arrow. Uh, we just uh, and two plus four. You can also use equals, um, but personally, I prefer using the arrow um, because not everything that you're doing here is really going to look like uh, what we usually think of using the equals for. Um, and so, I like to think of this more kind of like as an assignment. Uh, but both, both will work. Um, now, notice that if you just run this simple command, nothing's produced, right? Because you're not asking it to show me what is 2 plus 4. You're telling it to assign the, the value of 2 plus 4 to A, right? So A is equal to 2 plus 4 is what you're telling it. So you're not telling it to print it, 
right? So if you want to see what two plus four is actually equal to, or if what a is actually equal to, there's two things you can do. You just type a and run it, and they'll show six, or you could write print a and six. Personally, I found this one a lot easier is the way I usually do it, but this works too. Uh, and so you're using the print function. Uh, and so if I did, um, oftentimes what you'll see people doing if they want the solution is to write a, this and this in two lines right below each other and run them both at the same time so that you'll get this. So you'll be assigning it to A and seeing the output at the same time. We can use these variables right, uh, in uh, calculations of their own. Right? So I can look at what is 2 plus A. Right? Because A is now a replacement. It's, you know, it has a value of 6. Uh, it represents 6. Right? So if I write 2 plus A, we get an output of 8. So earlier we said a is equal to 6, and now 2 plus 6 is equal to 8. Um, we can put that 2 plus a into a new variable, right? So we could say b is equal to 2 plus a. And then if we print a, we would get 8. I'm uh, sorry, if we print b, we would get 8 as well. Um, you can even do things like b is equal to a plus b, um, which you know, uh, will work. Uh, so we can replace the value of a variable by assigning a new value to it. For example, so we had a, we had assigned it a value of six, right? But now I'm telling, I'm changing that. I'm saying, you know, a is now equal to three times four. So if I print a now, I would get an answer of 12. Right, so the variable a has now been assigned the value of three times four. And this is important, right, because uh, you know, otherwise we'd very quickly run out of different variable names um, or we couldn't fix mistakes uh, that you did in your coding. So just be careful when you replace it. Remember that now I've replaced what my you know, a means. So a no longer means two plus four, it now means three times four, right? So uh, that's uh, a useful function. Um, when you name variables, right, so every time you're assigning something to kind of a variable A that takes on a value, um, variable names have to follow certain rules. Uh, they must begin with a letter, right, so A uh, would be fine. They must not include any mathematical operators in the name, right, so I can't put plus, minus, multiplier, for example, in the name. So don't, this is the one that causes a lot of problems for people sometimes is they put like a dash in a name, right? Like test dash one, uh, that will be a problem. You'll get an error there. Uh, they can't include any spaces, right? So if you want to just kind of separate out words, you can use an underscore, which is a, a fairly common and they're case sensitive. So for example, if you want to highlight that something is a first variable, uh, acceptable names would include things like var one, uh, var underscore one, first var. Unacceptable vary names would be var dash one, right? Because it's a mathematical operator. One var because it starts with a, uh, a uh, number, or variable one because it includes a space. So just quickly, um, let's look at kind of the assignment in uh, Studio. Let's come back and so that you can look at how we do it. Right, so here A. We ran, we signed a two, to two plus four. And right, so we're saving the results in the variable a. And I want to run this. Right. Like I said, if you just run this, you get to the error right away. But no, no output is printed, right? Because you're not telling it to print anything. You're just telling it save a as the output of this. But you now see over here, we've got a value a, right? And it's equal to six. Right, so in here where we print the different values that we've saved and the data sets, we now have something in here. And if we want to get the output, we can run either of these. And, right, so they both give us an output of six. We can use um, A in a calculation, right? So here uh, we're creating B using two plus A. And I want to print B also, right? So we have B is equal to eight. Now over here on, on the right, so we created a new value. Let's replace A, right? So remember again, 
even though we can see it up here, let's just remember it down here, a is currently equal to six. When we, now we're assigning a, a new value, variable a now takes on a new var, uh, value, right? And if we print it, right, and we can print it and see that. it's equal to 12. Now, if we look up here, it used to say a is equal to six, uh, but now we can see that uh, a is equal to uh, 12. So the value over here has changed. Let's jump back to our tutorial. And again, try all that on yourself by yourself just so you get used to writing the syntax. So don't just run my script, make a new script of your own doing all of these different things. Um, so that you just see how it works yourself. And uh, you can try, you know, different calculations. You can give a new, you know, new uh, uh, values, right? You don't have to use three times four, you can use something else and see what happens. You can try playing with different combinations, uh, you know, just so that you get kind of a feel for how it works. All right, so, so far we kind of said like a is equal to one thing, like a is equal to the value of six, right? But oftentimes we want kind of, you know, data that includes more than one value, right? So our variables will have more than one value, right? So for example, say we might have a variable of scores on uh, test number one, uh, and there might be, you know, well, in our class there's 28 students, right? So we would have 28 different uh, values that we want to be saving in that variable. Right, and so to do so, um, we use vectors, right? And so a vector is a sequence of data elements of the same type, right? And this allows us to create variables that have multiple different inputs. So a set of elements can be input as a vector using the concatenate function. Uh, just, it's a function of C, open parentheses, and the different things that you want in it. Uh, most of the time, to help you remember C, just think of it as combine, it's not technically, it actually is this word, um, but if you th just think of it as combine, it'll help you remember. Anytime you wanna be combining something into a, a different, into a variable or, or into something, you're often gonna be using the C function, right? And so kind of a, a basic way of looking at it is, you know, we assign a vector name or a value name, so it could be A or uh, vec one or test one or whatever. We do C, and then we enter a string of data elements, so the different scores separated by commas. So this may seem confusing, so let's try a practical example that I think will make this a lot easier. Right? So if we select five students and look at their uh, numeric and letter grades on test one, right? so how did they get in terms, like what was their number grade out of 100, and what was their letter grade on test one, variables test one and test one leather would include five observations. right? So here we are assigning a variable test one, and we're saying that it equals to a vector of five different grades, right? So the first student got 80, the second student got 73, third student got 92, fourth student got 68, and the fifth student got 77. And then we could print this vector test one, and we get all five scores printed here. So now we have a string of different data. Um, we have a vector of data that represents Test one, how different people did. And we can input it as um, letter grades as well. But if we're entering characters, so non number variables, if we're entering categorical data, right, we need to enter it in single or double quotes. They'll separate it by comma, uh, but it's got to be in single or double quotes. And that's telling R that this is a character. Don't try to do math on it. Um, so for character strengths, the element must be placed in single or double quotes. Right, and then if we do test uh, one underscore letter, this variable which we created here, we get this vector of um, elements. So the different things that we entered, A, B, A, C, D. Um, and we can check what type of vector we've got. So do we have a numeric one or a categorical one using the mode function? The mode test one, the one that has numbers, produces that it's a numeric variable. We do mode test one letter, pro produces as a character one, right? So it shows that the elements uh, in test one letter 
with characters, um, not numbers, uh, or not numeric. Uh, you can only use one type of element in a vector. So for example, in the following vectors, uh, each uh, vector is treated as a character, or each element in the vector is treated as an element, right? And so this can take on multiple different forms. So here I made a variable test one mixed, right? And for some reason, I entered the 92, um, could be, you know, a mistake, but in quotes. And remember the quotes are telling are that this isn't uh, numeric data, this is categorical data, right? So this is a character. Don't treat 92 as if it's a number, right? It might be a jersey number or a phone number or something like that. It's not a number to be used in addition or subtraction or multiplication. Don't do math on it, right? So these other ones are numbers, right? So you could do stuff with like it. But if I run the mode, it's saying that this entire vector is character, right? Because you can only have one and it's going to go to the lowest level, right? Um, it's going to say that all of these are character. Um, the more likely scenario in this case is maybe I accidentally, when entering the grade, wrote four of them as numerically, one of them as a letter grade, right? So if I um, run the mode on this, it's showing that's character, right? So the, that means that the 80, 73, 68, and 77 will also be treated as characters when we're looking at this vector. Uh, now, there are multiple tools for getting properties of vectors. Um, and we'll look at a few of them. For example, length tells us how many elements are in the vector, right? So if we take, remember, we input five different characters, let's say. I, I created test one a long time ago, and I don't remember how many people were in it, or I don't remember, did all the students show up one day? Uh, so I want to see, you know, how many different uh, scores are in this vector. So I do length test one, and I print, uh, it'll get printed, and it shows there are five, right? And that's right, we had five different scores that went into test number one. We can use square brackets to identify or index, what we would call particular elements in the vector. So, say I want to find out how did student number three in the class do on test number one. So, I do test one, which is the name of the vector or the variable, and I write in square brackets three for the third student. And I print, okay, the third student did got a 92. I can find ranges within it. So, if I want to find how did the third through fifth student do, Right, so the three, the colon is showing like it's um, it's the same as like saying through. So third, fourth, and fifth would be this case, uh, and so this will print the third to fifth values, the so 92, 68, 77, and we can use a minus to say exclude this one. So if I do test one minus four, right, it'll print all of the scores except for the fourth, right? So the fourth, we remember, was 68. So here we're seeing the, all the other four except for 68. So if we want to find, you know, rather than opening up the data set and data view or something like that, uh, or rather than opening a vector, and uh, if we know the student number, where they are, we can just print it here and check. So this is a really useful way of just dealing with your data and finding the values you need with Without having to go into the raw data itself. Now let's imagine that we made a mistake or uh, an enter in the fourth individual or I do a regrade and I see oh they deserve something different. So we can replace an individual element with another value, right? So we take test one and the fourth observation, right? So we're saying test one four um, should be equal to, so we're assigning it a new value. Remember this is like equal or uh, assignment we're saying the fourth observation in test one fourth observation in test one is equal to 65 or give it the value of 65. so now if we reprint test one we see these four values are the same as before but now we get a 65 instead of what i think was a 68 before uh, so yeah the value has been changed from 68 to 65. Now imagine that we also add, so I, um, I wasn't finished grading when I created this vector, and so now I've graded two additional students. And so we can add them to the vectors, and we can add them to our list of scores, right? So test one included all the scores of the graded tests. And so here, remember, we use the combine or concatenate uh, function, right? So we're combining the vector for test one 
which we already have, the five students, and we're now adding two different scores. We're adding a six and seven score. So we're saying combine this vector, this you know, string of observations with these two additional observations. And so now if we press te uh, print test one, we see the five that we had before plus 73 and 79. So we've covered a lot right here. So let's go back into R and take a look at how that looks um, in practice, right? So again, so here we want to create kind of a variable with um, the di different scores that students got on test number one, the five that we've written, and I want to print it. So now, see, we've got a test one. It's a numeric variable, uh, range five. So we've got some good information right over here. Uh, and we can see the different values. If it's a, you know, a big data set, you're not going to be able to see all of them. But if it's a small vector, you can see actually all, um, all of them. If you've got 400, you're not going to see all 400 listed here. Uh, so that's useful. And below, we also saw, because we printed it, uh, we, we see the different elements. We can also create our test one here. And so we caught test one later. It's character. That's the character. Five in length, and again printed here. And we see five printed below. And they're in quotes, right? And printing quotes mean that they're character. We can create our next one. Okay. Now we've got two more. And again, just kind of previewing what's going to come below, because they had a mixture of characters and numbers, so all treated as characters. So it's a character vector, five in length, and you can see that all of them are in quotes. Right? Even the ones that were entered as numbers are treated as if they're character. So here there's no quotes around the 80, here there's quotes around the 80, and quotes around the 80. Um, so these will all be treated as if they're you know, not numeric, so don't say do math with them. Don't uh, do 80 plus, you know, 73 equals uh, 153. Because we're saying don't do that. But here you could. Um, all right, so let's check the mode, right? Even though it's listed here, if you want to be double checking the mode, uh, which if you've got a lot of data, this could be faster because uh, this can fill up pretty quickly. Um, right, so we've got numeric, character, character, and character. And see, if you want to be reading along too, um, if you just want to go into the script, I'm putting comments for pretty much everything we're doing. Uh, length shows how long, you know, how many elements are in the vector, so how many people took test number one. So it shows five. We can identify particular elements, and we can identify the third, the third, the fifth, or all except for the fourth. So if we run each of those, we see the third, third, fourth, and fifth, and the third, uh, first, second, third, fifth. We can replace the value of element with 65, or uh, fourth element with 65. So the fourth student, we corrected, they had uh, 68 before. We want to change it to 65. So we can see the 65 here, but we can also see it's now 65 up here. And we can add two scores, right, to test number one, to two more students took it using the combine function or concatenate function. So now we see down here printed seven, but we also see now up here, it's numeric still, but what all of these are still five in length. This is now seven in length. Uh, and all the different variables are, are listed, or all the different, sorry, values or observations are listed here. Two different scores are listed here. Uh, and so we put a lot of different information just looking at the values here about what we've got, uh, which is really useful, but we can also get a lot of these from using different commands. So length is one when you're dealing with vectors that is really useful. Uh, mode. Uh, for checking, you know, what type of data I have before you want, if you use any mathematical operators with them, you want to make sure that you've got numeric data. There's ways of changing character data into numeric. Uh, for example, uh, this test 
one mixed, right? Maybe that 92 didn't, wasn't meant to be entered as a character, right? We could change this into numeric data. I'm not going to show you how to do that today, uh, but that is something that we can do. All right. So now we've looked at uh, one kind of test or one vector of data, right? So test one, which had five. But you know, oftentimes when we're dealing with statistics, and as you will see in the previous lab, we're dealing with tables of data with multiple different variables, right? So now I'm going to show you kind of how to make tables of data. So let's imagine that the seven students in the class take a second test uh, and they receive the following scores, right? So what we can do is we can create a vector here, test two, with all of these different scores, right? So we've got seven different students, seven scores. So the first student got an 82 on the first test, the uh, second student got a 71 on the second test, 87, blah, 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 right? So now we've got vectors of test one, how people did on test one and how we, uh, they did on test two, right? But we want to combine and make kind of like a, a score of one so we can see how the different students did on test number one and test number two, uh, right? And so we can make a table um, using the data frame uh, function, right? And so let's call um, this table scores, or we could have called it grade, but let's call it scores, right? And so we assign the table scores to be a data frame with test number one and test number two, right? And if we print scores, we see now we've got seven students, right? Two variables, two columns, test number one, test number two. And so, you know, we can see student number one got an 80 and then an 82. Student number two got a 73 and then a 71. Student number three got a 92 and 87. We just combined the two different uh, variables that we had for the different tests into one common table. We could add more and more and more different tables. Um, we can also add more and more different students, which we'll show you below. And so we use the com commands rbind or cbind, so uh, row bind or column bind to add additional data to the table. So we use rbind to add additional observations or rows to the table. So if we want to add new, more students, for example, so if an eight student received 75 on test one and 78 on test two, we can add it to the table using the following command. So first we need to make a vector for student number eight. So we'd make a vector so showing that scores eight. So scores for uh, student number eight, we got a 75 and a 78. Um, and we need it to be of the same length, right? So if we're adding a row, um, each row has two inputs, right? So we need, if we want to be combining it, we want to be adding it to the table, we need a row that's got two uh, values in it, right? So we can't just combine to a table, this table, we can't just combine uh, something with, you know, one number or with three numbers, right? Because it wouldn't know how to, to put that. Where would it put that one number? Does it put it in this column, in this column, three? Where the heck is that third column coming from? Um, so once we've got this vector showing that student scores, Right, once we've got that variable for that student's course, we can now just row bind it onto the existing table, right? So we take the existing table, and we're saying bind the student to it. And now if we print it, we got before we had scores one through seven, now we've got scores one through eight. Now we can use cbind to add additional variables. So let's assume students took a third test and we want to add it to the, the grade sheet. Um, so we, first what we'll do is we'd create a variable test three like we've done before, right? So there's eight students now. So here's the scores that the eight students got. Uh, and we'd use, um, we'd assign scores. Uh, we'd be updating our data frame scores or our table scores to say that it doesn't only include what we, our previous data frame, but we're adding uh, a column of test number three, right? So we're adding a new variable to it. We're taking the variables that were here, and we're adding another variable to it here. So if we print, we've got test number one, test number two, and test number three, right? So we've updated the scores data frame to add a new table. Um, 
So we've now got, if we look at it, we've got three different tests and eight different values. All right, so we can still, like with vectors, we can use the square brackets to select individual elements, right? Uh, but we now have to give, before we could just give a single number, I want to you know, fit the four students. Now I have to give a little bit more information because we're selecting from rows and columns. We're selecting from students and from tests. And so in the square brackets, it always goes in a kind of row, comma, column manner for selecting number one. So if we wrote, for example, scores two, comma, three, that identifies the second score from the third test. Right, and so 69, uh, second score from the third test was second, student number two, third test, we got a 69. And so two comma three. Um, if we do scores two comma blank, right? So we're saying, I want the second student, but I'm not selecting, I'm not saying what column I want. Uh, it'll identify all the scores of the second student. Right, so I'll show they got a 73 on test number one, a 71 on test number two, and a 69 on test number three. And if we put scores blank comma three, right, we're telling it, okay, I don't care about selecting any particular row, but I want column number three. And so that's uh, selecting all the scores on test number three. And so here they're printed. There's another, and usually for if you're selecting for variables, um, so columns, there's a more useful usually way of doing it, and that scores dollar sign the variable name. Um, it's more useful um, because oftentimes you're going to remember the variable name better than its, vari its column number, particularly if you're dealing with a, a data set with you know sometimes hundreds of different columns, you're not going to remember which one was column 65, but you might remember the variable name. Uh, so, in this case, it's not hard. We had three columns, so remembering test three as the third column is not particularly difficult. But with more complex cases, for selecting columns, this is um, often uh, the easier way, right? So, scores, dollar sign test three, produces the same as what this did. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that we can use to get information um, about the variables in the columns or about uh, variables in the, in the table. And some of them are listed here. And I'll show what each of them does. So length, so usually it's better to use length just with vectors and use different ones when you're dealing with a, a table. Um, but it'll give the number of columns. N row, standing for number of rows, will give the number of rows, obviously. So there are eight rows, um, eight different students. N call uh, for number of columns. Uh, tells you the number of variables, the number of columns that are in your table. So here, there's three, right? Test one, test two, test three. Uh, dem for dimensions gives, of uh, the table score, gives rows, columns. So rows always come first, then columns, right? So it's, so we've got eight rows and three different columns. Names will give us the variable names. And then row names, will give us the uh, names of um, the different rows. Um, so right now, we didn't assign any names to them. So they're just listed as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, you could change the ID on them. So to say student one, student two, student three, student four, or student IDs or something like that. Um, so, but you know, oftentimes that's not done. Um, Call names, the call names. So some of the names will give the variable names, right? So say you can't remember what you call the variable, right? You don't remember, did you do test three or test underscore three? Right? You could do call names, uh, scores, and it'll print out all the different ones and you'd be like, oh yeah, I did test three, no space, right? So you know what to do. All right, so let's launch back over to our studio and run through these kind of just practically and what they look like exactly in R. All right, so here we're creating a new vector um, for test number two, a new variable. So ran it, and we can see test two is here. So one to seven in length, and all the different scores written here. Now we want to create a table or a data frame that combines both of them into one table. 
So, and I'm going to print it so I'm looking forward to. So we see columns like what we saw in the tutorial, but now we can also look and we've got now under data, we've got a data frame, right? So we've got a table. Um, so before all these were just variables, they were just vectors or uh, single values um, for the different kind of variables we had, um, where now we've got a natural data frame. So if we click, double click on it like a, before, we can see the table here. So when I said kind of like a data viewer, um, so we'll, we'll see the table here in a different tab. But like I said, don't change anything in here. This is just for inspecting purposes, but you can have it launched there and then you just close that tab. So now we've created our first table. Um, we can add scores for each student. So first thing we have to do is we have to create a vector with the scores for that eighth student, right? So we combine, okay, they got a 70, uh, five and a 78. So we create that. We then bind it to the existing table. Uh, and because we're adding a new row, we use rbind. And so now we see when we print scores, we've got an eighth student down here. And if we look over at scores, it's now eight observations of two variables, uh, where before it was seven observations of two variables. We can also add a test three, right? So we create test three. You should now be getting familiar with how to create uh, vectors for tests. So we've got test three, eight uh, different students. Uh, now, uh, I, I just, I'll come back to that in a second. And we can now add it into the table. And we'll see three tests, eight columns. There's something important to know. So test number three shows eight observations, but test number two and test, num uh, test number one both show seven, right? Because we didn't update the value, the vector test two, right? We updated the value in the table, right? We created a table and then we're now working with that table. We're not working with these variables anymore. Um, so when we update, you know, test one in the data frame, we're dealing with the data frame. We're not dealing with any of this stuff. So remember how it can get replaced. So here, we still see test two has eight different things, even though it's not shown here. Um, so at this point, we could even delete this and it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. We can select different um, scores, right? So if you want the second student score on the third test, if we want all the second student scores, and if we want all scores on test number three, we can use either of these two procedures here. Uh, so this one means, right, so we're naming the data frame and same with element. This one we're saying naming the data frame or we're naming the variable from within this data frame, right? So uh, this is important, right? Because if I wrote, say, down here, I'm just going to write here just as an example, right? If I wrote test two and printed it, this is telling me take the value test number two. We haven't told it look in the data frame, look in the table. We've just told, okay, find test two. It found test two here. It's got seven in length. If I write scores and see things will pop up over here, right? I've got, so you could type it in, but you could also select it, which is useful if you're forgetting your variable names, um, that it'll, you know, help you remember. If I do this, it's the same, take test two out of the table. And here is the appropriate one with eight, right? So it's important if I want test number three to, uh, or test number two to look in the appropriate data frame. Then we've got a whole bunch of different things that we have to get information on it. Uh, these are really useful in inspecting your data. All right, so random and there's all the different information that we had below. All right, so let's go back to our tutorial. We're doing well. And obviously pause it if you want to be trying some of these things. If you want to add a test four or a student nine and ten, uh, just to you know test out that you know how to do it. That's a good idea. Um, so oftentimes we are um, not going to be, you know, 
inputting the data ourselves. We're going to be taking it from, you know, an outside data source, maybe, you know, from Statistics Canada or something like that. Um, and so oftentimes we, we could be importing data into R instead of just entering it the way we do. Um, so the first thing that you would want to do, and you're just going to generally want to do this in all of your projects. Um, so not all the way down here, not just if you're importing data. Um, you're going to want to set your working directory. And this is just so that it tells R um, where to look for things. Otherwise, if you're importing data each time, you'd have to write the full file path. So kind of the more, or if you're saving things, you'd have to kind of write the full file path, um, which could get long and annoying. Um, so what we do usually at the start of a project is we say, we set the working directory and we tell our, you know, for this project, you know, if I'm bringing a file, it's coming from this folder, right? So I've told, for example, in my case, I've told R that all the different files are, you know, you, you put this for your own, but it's in blah, 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 Champlain College, uh, Quantitative Methods, my Winter 2020 folder, in my lab folder, and in my folder called Lab One Home. Right? And so all the different data sets that I'm using for today, all the different scripts, everything that I need for today is saved in a folder lab one home. So if I tell you open a document, look in lab one home. If I tell you save something, you know, save it there. This is the project for today. Um, and so what you could just generally do is go into the folder. So I would suggest creating a different folder for each lab, right? So that you don't mix up your different documents. Um, and set the working directory. So you can copy and paste from your file folder, say, right, what is the path. The only difference, say, um, I don't know about Mac, but Windows uses, um, separating folders uses backslash. Uh, you're gonna have to change all of those to a forward slash shortcut. And make sure to put them in quotes, right? So it's got that the quote, so um, for the path. So you're gonna have to change this for whatever folder you want. Um, I was running it out of my computer, so I needed to set my working directory, and I wanted to give you um, an example. Um, so this is kind of the path where mine is being found. Okay. Um, so yeah, set a different working directory for each lab. Uh, and so yeah, I've got like in that folder, I've got all the different data sets we need for today, so I can just now open them. Uh, so usually you get your source from an outside, uh, your data from an outside source like Stats Canada, and you can import the data using different methods, right? So if it's in kind of just a, a normal text file, uh, you can use the read table function. And this isn't one that, um, often I get mine in a different format than a, a text document. Um, but if it's in a text document, um, use the read table function. And so I've got one and I've shared it with you so you can try opening this too. So put it in your working directory folder, and you can write in the name. So it's called lab1table.txt. Um, and so if you run this command, it would open it. If you hadn't set your working directory, you'd have to, for this one, write in all of this, go away, then another slash, and then lab1table.txt, right? So if you're only doing that once, it's not such a big deal. But if you're opening multiple things or saving multiple things, that could be cumbersome, right? So it's just better. Um, it's telling it, okay, look here, because it's at the work directory, we're looking already in that folder for this. Um, header equals true is just telling um, R that the first row are um, headers, are variable names, right? So test one, test two, test three type thing. Uh, so don't treat it as if it's actual data. These are just the variable names that you should bring in. If you set this to false, which will rarely be the case, because usually the first um, row are your variable names. But if you ever go to data set where that's not the case, um, and so you want it to be treated in the first row as if it's data, you'd set header equals false. But that's going to be very, very rare. Generally speaking, when we import data, um, it'll uh, set the header equals true. And I think that's actually the our default uh, is to assume that it's header equals true. Oftentimes, though, when I import data, I import it as a CSV file. Um, it, oftentimes, if you download data, you can get it off the internet you directly as a CSV file, or if you get it as an Excel file from Excel, you can save, you can do like file save as, you can uh, select it as a comma separated value, so a CSV file, save it there. Um, so that's the more common way that I get my data. Um, most sites will give it in either an Excel or CSV format, 
Um, and so this is the way that you then import my data. And I like it in this format because often before I import it into, um, into R, I, I like to look at it for just a little bit, see what's in there, see what type of problems I might be facing, if there are other missing values, stuff like that. And so I like usually looking at it in Excel. Um, and so CSV is useful for that, or Excel is useful for that. And then, so if we're using a CSV, if we want to be importing a CSV, there's a, a specific command for that called read.csv. So it would look like I've got a data set called rate beer on beer ratings uh, that I had from a different class when I was in school. Um, and so in this one, I'm caught giving a name. And again, we always give names, right? So this one I call data one. So I'm giving my data frame, I'm giving my table a name. The same, you know, if I say data one something, it means I'm pointing to that table. I'm assigning uh, that table to data one. And here I'm assigning it to something called beer, right? Uh, so if I were to print beer, if I were to write beer, it'd print out that table. Um, but I'm not going to do it um, because that table is pretty big. Um, but let's look at importing it, right? So uh, go back into our studio. So this step again, you're going to have to change, send the working directory, you're going to have to change it because this isn't going to be what your folder's called. Um, and so you're going to have to go with whatever your folder's called and remember to change the slashes. You'll get an error message if you don't, then it'll be pretty obvious what the error is. Um, so don't worry too much about it. So I'm just setting my working directory. Um, now I want to bring in both of these different data sets, right? So here we go. We see we've got a data one and we've got a beer. Um, so the reason I didn't want to print beer was I remember that there was 400 observations and I didn't want this whole screen just filled up with data for beer. Um, but we could double click on it, see, and here's the different data. So you could scroll through and take a look. Um, it's a CSV, so you also could have opened it in Excel. Um, but I take a look at kind of what's in it. And so that's pretty easy. So now we've got three different data frames open uh, and we've got information on them. We've got different values. Um, all right, so let's go back to our tutorial. All right, so when you import new data, one of the most important things to do first is inspect it, right? So you might've already done it in Excel or something like that, or you might be familiar with the data, but you still wanna see how did it come in to R? Um, you know, how is R treating it? Um, and this is particularly important because sometimes you might be thinking something generic, but R is gonna treat it as character or something else. Um, so we wanna see, you know, how's this showing up in R? How's R treating it? Um, so one of the first steps I always do, every time I open a data set, I use the head function. Um, and sometimes you get, like I said, you're going to have data sets that are long, 400 or 10,000. I've had uh, data sets open that had multiple million observations. And you don't want to print multiple million observations on your screen. Um, it's going to take a while and just take a long time to scroll through. Um, so what head does is it just shows the first um, number of rows in the data frame, and it defaults to six, right? So if you just write head equals beer, it uh, defaults to the six rows in the header. So head, this is variable one with the first six entries, variable two with the six entries, variable three, variable four, variable five. You can change head if you want to see greater or lesser amount by using an option, an option. So you could do head, say I want to see the first 10 plus the, the header, right? I do head for beer, comma 10. Um, and if you want to learn more about the different options that are say available for head, you could do the uh, question mark head uh, and it'll um, give you a description. I'll show you that when we launch back over to our studio. So here we've got the first 10 of each of them, right? So this isn't the same as checking everything in your data set. So I still, you know, you still check it in, in, uh, in Excel or something like that or your text editor, um, but it at least gives you an idea. Okay, what am I looking at here? The next thing I do after I've done head is I use a uh, strength uh, or STR uh, in beer. And it just provides useful information about our data, right? So it tells me, okay, it's a data frame with 400 observations of five variables. So that's good information right there. It tells me 
with different variable names and after uh, dollar sign, right? So remember, we often do like uh, data frame name, dollar sign, uh, variable name for selecting it. So these are showing these are all different variables. It shows the type of variable. So we've got factor, number, and integer. We're not going to deal with factor variables today, but they're really they're, they're categorical data that have levels. Um, and so oftentimes, for example, you think of like uh, a factor variable we use often will be say something like men, woman. Uh, the one will be given like zero or one uh, in, in coding, but we're treating them as uh, kind of categorical data, but with, with different levels. Um, and this is used for um, comparisons and stuff like that. So once we actually start using factor variables, uh, we'll talk more about them. So you don't have to worry about too much. But number and integer, um, you would have seen this in SPSS before. So integer would be any that you know, doesn't have any decimal places and numeric would be any that has uh, decimal places, so 5.2, uh, 5.1, 7.9. Uh, and so it'll tell you the type of variable and it'll give you some of the first entries for that. So you can take a look, okay, one, two, three, four, five, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so the head and STR are the first things that I'm gonna look at. Um, so you can see what are the different variables? What, are, what does it kind of look like? Um, and get important information. The main thing I'm going to be looking at here often is how many observations that's useful to me, right? Because I don't see that when I run head. And I'm going to look at what did R code these? Did they actually code, you know, the numeric ones as numeric, the integer ones as integer, the factor ones as factor, or do I need to change that? Uh, that's not something you have to worry about today, but it's a good habit to get into right from the get go. Every time you open a new data set, run head and str uh, so uh, let's uh, go over into r and take a look all right so inspecting our data so i'm just going to run all of these at the same time so we had head for the first six we we'll see uh, right here uh, it gets a little bit messy if you've got a lot of variables uh, where it typically gets fill across multiple rows because you can't fit all of it here. Um, like you saw kind of in, in the PDF, it's filled over. Um, here's the first 10, and here's string. And I said that I'd tell you about the help, so. Uh, okay, it this didn't, uh, my intro didn't work. Okay, so uh, if you take like, for example, function head and you want to learn more information about it, uh, so question mark head, and here's where I talk about, so here's kind of documentation on the function, right? So it tells you returns the first or last part of an object, different things about the usage and the options available, so the different arguments you could put in, um, and so all of the different functions that might be running will have something like this, right? So it uh, takes a form. Uh, there's also a tails one that prints the last one. So it's a form of X. So what is the, the variable, uh, or sorry, the data frame that you want? And then N equals whatever if you want to change from the default. And then just examples, who created it, stuff like that. So you can get useful information on different functions, right? So the one that I had open before was for the C function of concatenate, right? Uh, and so here you can get information on, on that one too, and examples and whatnot. So that's useful if you kind of get a little bit lost or you don't, in particular, if you need to be selecting options, what you can do. That's kind of your first line of defense for getting help. All right. Now, in previous classes, you've learned a lot about descriptive statistics. Um, so now let's just go over and look at getting descriptive statistics. Uh, so for all these things, there's multiple ways of, of doing it. Um, 
uh, there's more than one way of kind of probably finding all of these in different packages with different advantages. Um, so I want to find, but let's just, these are kind of the basic and the easiest ones uh, to use. Uh, and they're ones that you're going to be using over and over and over again. And they're pretty easy to memorize, thankfully, most of them. Um, so let's take in the beer data set, there is a variable called ABV for alcohol by volume. Um, and uh, so, and there's ratings, right? So these are a couple of numeric ones or integer ones that were there. So ratings, how, how do people rate the beer? Um, and so if we calculate descriptive statistics, we have to identify both the data set and the variable of interest, right? And so here again, uh, the dollar sign one is useful. Uh, so is data set dollar sign variable. Uh, and so here's calculated different statistics. So if we want to calculate the mean value of ABB, we'd use mean beer data set, and this was the variable name. Uh, and so we get a mean. We want to find the median, we use median, same thing. We want to find the variance, the variable name is var, V-A-R, and then data set uh, variable. We want to find the standard deviation, it's just SD. We want to find the range, it's range. Uh, we use the range variable, so it'll show the lowest was zero, the highest was 12.8. Uh, interquartile range, which we learned about. Uh, um, we use IQR, and it'll give there's an interquartile range of 2.1. Uh, it's important that uh, it uses a slightly different formula than what you learned in class. So if you did by hand in here, you might get a different result sometimes, depending on the data set. Um, you can use sum, and this calculates the cumulative sum of alcohol by volume. So in this case, that you know, isn't something that you necessarily need to do, but it shows that uh, the cumulative sum is this, um, which doesn't mean much here um, by itself. But in some other cases, this could be a very useful function. Uh, it's one to remember. Um, max, what is the maximum value? Min, what is the minimum value? Uh, length, so how many observations are there? So how many different beers were there? It's 400, which we've seen before. And then summary is actually just kind of a nice one that produces uh, uh, kind of uh, a number of different uh, uh, so the min, the first qu uh, quartile, median, mean, third quartile, and the max. Uh, so if you just run sum, you actually get a lot of these. You don't get the uh, uh, variance and standard deviation, but you get a lot of the other things. So this is a useful function to run early. And whenever I um, start a new project with a, and a new data set, I usually run some form of some statistics, some of the on the important variables, because you just want to learn a little bit about your data before you go further. Um, so this is um, important. Um, I also want to show you something about errors, right? So we've talked before about um, the difference between, say, a character or, and numeric var uh, uh, variables or vectors and how important um, that can be um, because it tells R whether you can do math or not on it. And so if you remember our test one next, which all the number, all of them look like numbers, but the 92 was entered in quotes, so it was treating it all as character. Right, so if I try to take the mean, we end up with a warning message. Warning in mean uh, test one mixed argument is not numerically logical, and so it's returning uh, NA or missing uh, because you can't do the mean on non-numeric data. You need numbers, things that you can add and divide. Uh, so. Uh, it's nonsensical, for example, of taking the mean of ABC. I don't know how to add up ABC. Uh, it's also, you know, uh, nonsensical to take the average of phone numbers. What does average of phone numbers even represent? Uh, so uh, that's something just, you know, to be careful of. That's why I, I talked a lot about it, inspecting your data, making sure that it all comes in the right way. And if we want to see why, we see mode was character, right? And so if you're getting a mode character, uh, then 
uh, you can't do math on it. And then just a couple of things. These aren't going to be fancy graphs, um, but just a couple of basic ones. And R has so many different ways of producing graphs and tailoring them. But just kind of the, the ultimate and basics. You can make a histogram using the hist function. And it will give you something like this. Gamma beer. So all this could be tailored and changed and stuff like that. Uh, and you can make a box plot of beer ABV again. So a box plot. And if you're doing this again, it could all be tailored. And but it would look something like this right here. Uh, so the max was I think 12.8, the min was zero. Uh, and here's the different parts, the whiskers and, and whatnot. Um, so again, there's many ways of doing this. And at some point, we might talk more about data visualization in more detail than it. Next are graphs and detail them a little bit. Uh, you can do entire courses just on, uh, I've done an entire course on data visualization in R. There's so many different things that you can do. Um, but uh, the tailor and everything. But those are just kind of some of your basics that show a little bit of the functionality. Um, so I'm going to show this, and then we'll come back with a couple of concluding things. So go back to our studio, and I'll just skip this stat. So I'm just going to run through all of these kind of in bulk, right? And you can see all the different outputs that we had that are down the bottom left, all of them. Um, but the ones I really want to show, uh, oops, yeah, this one I want to show. So you'll get your error message down here. So it comes to, to NA with the warning message as to why um, it didn't do what you know you were probably expecting it to do. Uh, so that's something to definitely read. It's not something that you can do. And here's producing the two graphs, and this is one of the things I definitely really want to show. Um, so. We've got a box plot, but we did the other one first. We've got our histogram down here. The arrow we can go, so we can go back and forth between them. Um, but what's really useful is the export, right? So you can save as image, you can save as PDF, you can copy the clipboard and, and paste it in, right? So this gives you different options that you want. So in an exercise, if I say produce, you know, a, a different graph, you can do so, and you can just, you know, paste it in. So you could copy the you know, the function that you ran, and then just do it and, you know, either copy the clipboard or save as image and then paste it into your document. I wouldn't save it as PDF for these labs because then you couldn't, it'd be harder to put into your document. Um, but that could be useful for other, for, and you could actually paste a, a PDF one into a Word document, say. Um, but the others might be more simple for you. Uh, so. And again, that's really easy to use. You can use this to clear the environment or clear all plots, right? So, yeah, so now all the history is gone. Um, and similarly, right, I can use this. If I'm done with all this stuff, I can hit this and it'll clear all of this from kind of our memory. Uh, so, if I would have to, if I hit A, nothing would happen. So, if I cleared a, if I cleared all this and I typed A, it, nothing's assigned to it anymore. A is no longer equal to 12 and B is no longer equal to 8. And all, none of these data frames would be loaded into, into R. So you'd have to reload them or recreate them uh, in the future. Um, but if you hit save, uh, for example, so uh, once you've done this, right, so say we clear all this. Right, and I close this. I'm just closing this tab to simulate closing R, right? And then if I go to this one, right, so there's no data here, but I can take all of it. It'll run it all. All my data will reappear. All my graphs will reappear. So that's what I talked about in terms of it's more useful than down here because if you typed all your commands down here, which you could do, you'd have to rerun everything. You'd have to recreate all of these from scratch. But if I save my script, I can just load it the next time I need it. 
and run it. And if I need to remember, I don't remember how to create a data frame. Well, I'm like, well, I created a data frame in lab one home. So I can look, oh, there's data frame. I don't remember how to use Rbind. Well, I used Rbind down here. So I can see, oh, that was how I used Rbind last time. That's how I do it. And it's actually something I do a lot when I'm doing uh, different uh, projects. So just follow step by step. I know that some of this code looks daunting, right? But all the exercises we're doing, and even in future weeks when we're adding more complex stuff, we're just going to be doing different versions of these same things, right? So we might be using a different data set. But say you want to find, uh, uh, you know, you're not dealing with tests, you're dealing with heights of students, right? Or uh, height in one is uh, height and another is weight. Uh, or amount of time studying and grade on tests, so different variables, right? So you might have grade, and one might be another variable, uh, time studying, right? And then you can make a data frame, uh, calling it uh, whatever the heck you want, data one, or something, usually names are better if they indicate something, like a data frame combining time studying and test, and then you have a table of that. Uh, or if you want to be adding them you know, another student or another player in a game, another survey respondent, uh, you know, you can use Rbind and just use your different data frame name and your different uh, vector that you're adding. Uh, if you want to be taking the mean, right, you just replace this with your data, new data frame and this with your new variable and you run mean and it's ready to go. Um, so because once you've learned all these or where to find all these, you don't even have to memorize these. You can just look them up each time. Uh, some of them you'll memorize pretty quickly, like means pretty easy to remember, median is pretty easy to remember. But you can just look them up and just follow the order that we followed here and it'll work out, right? So it's, that's what makes R so um, useful, uh, particularly for this type of class, is that if you just follow step-by-step -step instructions and just replacing and tailoring it to your data as needed, um, it's easy. Just copy your code into a new script, right? So say I wanted to do, uh, again, creating the data set, right? So I could, you know, copy into a new one, okay? And then I would need a vector for test one. Uh, Right, get a good, give it a new name. Time studying. I could now input the appropriate value. So eight students would be, you know, these could be now minutes. Uh, right, and this could be the scores they got. Here's on the test that we care about. We could create a data one, data one, data frame, time, studying, test. Uh, obviously, all of this will need to be changed. Like your comments will need to be changed. But I'm just doing this with a quick, like if you're doing, you know, a new project. And there you go. Time studying and scoring tests. So time studying minutes, score on the test. And so that would create a new data frame. Just using the template and just replacing the data and the variable names as needed, creating a new data frame. Easy to do. All right. So now I'm ending. So I'm just going to clear all this stuff. It's a bad idea, especially if you're not going to be using it again. And we can go back to this. And so there's a few different exercises that I want you to do for the Friday assignment. They're pretty easy. Um, so I give you kind of detailed instructions. You're going to be using some of the data that we've already used. So don't clear it or or we'll just have to recreate it. You just run your script again. No big deal. 
um, if you did clear the data already. You can be using some of the data that we've already imported, and you're going to be using a built-in data set called empty cars. Um, and this is a data set that's built into R, um, so you shouldn't have to install it. Um, and it uh, looks at the fuel my mileage of different cars. So uh, there's, most of the questions are about this empty cars data set. Uh, so, uh, and they're going to be using only procedures that we've already seen. All of them are different functions that we've already seen. Um, so complete them. Most of them are quite easy. Things like mean, standard deviation, histogram, box plot. Question number eight, you're going to have to think a little bit. Um, but uh, it's, again, only using functions that we've already seen. All right, so that concludes lab one. You'll have access to this tutorial as a PDF. Um, so you can go through this. You're going to have my R script um, that um, the one that I kept switching back and forth to. So you'll have my R script, so all of my different coding for doing it. So um, you can keep that open as you're doing the exercises too. Um, you'll have the video um, and you'll have the different data sets. So the rate beer and the data one, uh, table one lab, whatever it was called, the text file. So you can play around with those two a little bit. Um, and uh, shoot me an email if you've got any questions or uh, discuss it with each other, try, you know, um, working out with colleagues or using R's built-in help function, which is really useful. Um, you can use it for inspecting data sets also, right? So if you want to learn something about empty cars, you can use the question mark two to inspect empty cars, and it'll give you information about that data set, which might be useful to you uh, as well. And so that concludes the tutorial for lab number one.